Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 6th, 2018, and my guest is political scientist Liliana Mason of the University of Maryland. She is the author of Uncivil Agreement, How Politics Became Our Identity, which is our topic for today. Liliana, welcome to EconTalk. Thank you so much for having me. In a recent EconTalk episode uh, that we'll link to, I did a monologue on the tribal nature of politics and the decline in civility, and your book, takes us, I think, uh, quite a bit deeper into those ideas and, and really uh, gives some insight into what's been changing, which I think is the biggest challenge. I think a lot of people understand that seem, things seem a little bit different. The question is why and what has changed. And let's start with an, a story that you tell at the beginning of your book, uh, the, the Robber's Cave Experiment. Uh, tell us what happened there. Yeah, so this is um, uh, a very old experiment done in 1954 by uh, social psychologists. They recruited a bunch of fifth grade boys from uh, Oklahoma City and um, and tried to gather boys that were as similar socially to each other as possible. So they were all white, they were all Protestant, they all did sort of, they had sort of similar educational and social fitness. Um, and uh, they divided the boys into two different camps and, and put them in the summer camp in Robbers Cave State Park outside of Oklahoma City. Um, and the idea was that they wanted to figure out how, uh, what, it, what it looks like when two groups um, sort of form and then, and then to what extent are they naturally inclined to engage in conflict between each other? And so they, uh, they spent a week with the boys not knowing about the other team. Um, they came up with their own names. They called themselves the Rattlers and the Eagles. And they, uh, after a week, they were told about the other boys, uh, and they immediately, um, uh, started, competitions with the other team, just baseball games, um, various different kinds of competitions. Uh, and they, and very, very early on, they started calling each other names, um, derogatory names. Um, and, uh, and then gradually they, uh, their conflict escalated beyond the competitions and they started doing things like attacking each other's camps. Um, and then by the end of the second week, uh, the, the, uh, the counselors who were actually the, the social psychologists had to uh, had to stop all the competition because the boys were were starting to engage in violent um, attacks on each other like rock throwing rocks and that and that type of thing so the idea was that it t- it took very little um, for these two these two very similar groups of kids um, to you know en- engage in relatively high levels of conflict. Um, really, all it took was separation and competition for for that to happen. Yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical of those that experiment, and and actually have a whole bunch that were done in the 1950s that that seem to have <laughs> persisted. I wonder, you know, how much the experimenters tweaked the experience to get something dramatic. I wonder how many, if they'd done it 20 times, it would have happened every time. But putting that to the side, I, I want to read a a quote from the book that I thought summed up the the phenomenon quite well. You say, humans are hardwired to cling to social groups. There are a few good reasons for us to do so. First, without a sense of social cohesion, we would have had a hard time creating societies and civilizations. Second, and even more basic, humans have a need to categorize. It's how we understand the world. This includes categorizing people. Third, our social categories don't simply help us understand our social environment. They all also help us understand ourselves and our place in the world. Once we are part of a group, we know how to identify ourselves in relation to the other people in our society, and we derive an emotional connection and a sense of well-being from being group members. These are powerful psychological motivations to form groups. And I think it's important to say from the outset uh, that what I call tribalism in my essay and, and EconTalk episode and what you call sorting or, or sorting various types of identity, this is a very normal – it's a human thing. There's nothing inherently – something inherently bad about it. It doesn't have to lead to violence. There are many good things about it. So just comment 
about about this uh, the, the human nature aspect of this human nature aspect. Yeah, so this is uh, this is a point that I try to make um, a few times in the book because I think it's really important. The idea that we, you know, are are strongly identified with our groups is not uh, should you know it's it's not an insult to say that we that we do that. Um, we are all doing it at the same time. We are all um, really you know deeply motivated to behave in this way. Um, the you know the. There, there are a few studies that I that I talk about in the book, you know, where there are real like bi- biological evidence of of group membership. You know, people's, um, you know, levels of of cortisol in their saliva increases when they when they feel a threat to their group. I mean, the, the idea that your body is responding to the to your group membership suggests that it's very hard for us to control that. You can't control the level of cortisol in your saliva. Um, and so so these are things that it, we shouldn't try to avoid, but instead learn how to work with and learn how to sort of better understand what's happening so that we can stop it from getting out of control. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, understanding it is the first step to being able to manage it. I think the fascinating part about this is that it's one thing to think about your own group and the pleasure or comfort you get from feeling part of something larger than yourself, which I think is a deeply human urge that we economists uh, neglect simply, I think, because we have, don't have the tools to deal with it very well. But the other part of this that, that's the darker side is the desire to look down on uh, the other, to look down on people who aren't in the group, the people in the out group. And – what kind of research what, – what do we know about that phenomenon? Obviously, the, the Robbers Cave experiment, the Rattlers and the Eagles, is, is an example of that, You know, whether it was increased through some decisions made by the experimenters. Who knows? But, but there's definitely a human urge to not just feel part of your group but to look down on the other people not in your group. Right. Um, so the uh – one thing that we know is that there, there's sort of this ba- – in terms of the basic group membership, um, there's work by, um, by uh, Marilyn Brewer, a social, a social psychologist, who, that's found essentially that um, you don't actually – being a member of a group doesn't make you necessarily hate the other group. Um, it just makes you love your group the most. Um, and it isn't until there's a conflict between your in-group and your out-group that you start to despise the people in the out-group. Um, but the the most basic um, nature of group membership is just loving your group the most, thinking they're the best. Um, one of the things that we know is that when you are a member of a group, you tend to view the world in a way that makes your group seem better. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the examples from the Robbers Cave experiment was that, you know, the boys were asked to pick up uh, beans from the ground and then they were counting the number of beans that each each boy had collected, um, and the the experimenters were actually putting the same exact handful of beans on on the projector for the boys to count them every single time. Um, but every single boy estimated that there were more beans when it was one of their in group members than when it, when it was one of their out group members. Um, we also know that partisans, for instance, think the the economy is a lot better when their party is in power, um, and that literally can reverse over like overnight after election day <laughs> um, or after inauguration. Um, and so there are just sort of ways in which we see the world in a biased way that makes our group seem to be the not just the best but also the most beloved and the most powerful. And I want to mention an essay I forgot to mention in my monologue episode, which is uh, by Scott Alexander at the blog um, Slate Star Codex. He wrote an essay that basically I, I'm going to get the t- I'm close to the right title. I can tolerate everyone except the outgroup, so that <laughs> the modern reverence that we have for tolerance breaks down when it's really somebody we're not supposed to like. Uh, and I think that's a huge challenge that all that all of us have. Wh- what do we know about what's happened uh, to partisanship? In recent decades, there's a debate in political science. Uh, Mo Fiorina, my colleague here at the Hoover Institution, who's been a guest, talked about it. Uh, I'm pretty sure I, uh, in our, that episode I did with him a while back, I will link to that as well. But he's a skeptic. He doesn't think that things have gotten particularly more partisan. Uh, but And yet there's a lot of evidence also that, that perhaps it has. So talk about that dispute and, and why you believe it's gotten stronger, partisanship has. 
or the evidence yeah, his- that it has. Then we'll talk about why that that phenomenon is 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 happening. Right. So so his work is actually a ma- one of the major reasons that I started this project. Um, because he and uh, another political scientist, Alan Abramowitz, were having this sort of back and forth in, in multiple articles um, debating whether or not polarization was increasing in American politics, um, with Fiorita saying that it was not and, and Abramowitz saying that it was. Um, and in reading this, this, this debate, what I, what I started to think is they're both talking about polarization um, and defining it as – Americans are disagreeing with each other more about policy. And that is the traditional definition of polarization, that, that, that Democrats and Republicans are becoming more liberal and more conservative, more extreme in their, in their issue position. So, like, so essentially, our attitudes are distributed across you know, the spectrum from left to right in like a bimodal distribution. Um, and – but it wasn't matching what I was seeing in politics. So because I was seeing a lot of anger and, um, in, in, I guess, incivility, um, and uh, and people seem to be really riled up at e- at each other, but sort of not really connected perfectly to policy positions. Um, and so I started looking into this and 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 thinking, well, what if we think about partisanship as just any other group identity. And if we do that, then there's a wealth of literature and research on intergroup conflict, um, mostly looking at um, inter, intergroup, like racial conflict. And, and if we can apply that research to the parties, then maybe we can understand what could motivate them to, um, to hate partisans, to hate each other, without necessarily disagreeing on policy positions. Because most intergroup conflict is not rooted in policy debates. Most intergroup conflict is rooted in deep identities that people hold and this sense of, of us versus them. So, so that was the beginning of this project, really, was trying to think about Democrats and Republicans not as simply purveyors of policies, but instead as uh, you know, really strong groups that, that people can identify with um, so powerfully that they might be willing to even change their policy positions in order to just sort of have that group win. Yeah, I, I want to – let's turn to that, but I just want to say as a footnote, the, an example would be there would be an issue in the public debate, in the public sphere that used to be a source of contention, could be gay marriage, could be uh, – say legalizing marijuana that used to be extremely contentious now people seem to be closer together so it seems to be less polarization on many on many issues uh and, and yet as you point out on the feeling of us versus them that seems to be getting stronger so what evidence do we have that that is stronger the us versus them or my policy uh my party identification separate from my policy positions or my ideology Right. So we have um, just sort of in general, there are increasing numbers of people that are calling themselves strong partisans. We have on on the scale, you know, that goes from independent to weak partisan to strong partisan. Um, People are moving towards the strong partisan ends of the spectrum. Uh, Partisans are increasingly not wanting their party to compromise with the other side. Um, They tend to rate the out party as as much more extreme than they used to and uh, and and tend to rate their own party is not at all extreme. Um, partisans are happier uh, with their neighborhood if they are told that in-group partisans live there um, and uh, and they are less satisfied with their neighborhood if they're told that out-group partisans live there. So we have a, a lot of information about partisans just sort of feeling this, this sense of um, – you know, disdain and discomfort with the other side. What's weird about that is that, you know, my feel I'm not a political scientist, but I have many of my friends are. I just want to say that right up front. Uh, so I talk to political <laughs> scientists and read political science literature a little bit. Uh, and it was my impression until fairly recently that party identification was getting weaker, weaker in, the, in the zero one sense, that more people were identifying as independent. So is the claim here that that trend is reversed or is the claim here that the people who, who still identify as Republicans or Democrats are more intensely identifying as, as, as party members and party uh, – as partisans? Yeah, it's more the latter. Um, you're right. There are increasing numbers of people identifying as independent as well. Um, and 
so basically it's the people who call themselves weak partisans that are that there are fewer of. But it's important to note that m- the vast majority of people who call themselves independents vote as as if they are partisans very reliably. Um, so and there's a really great book called Independent Politics um, uh, by Clara and Kripnikov that that actually looks at why people are identifying as independent. And most of them, they say, are or a lot of them are, are just embarrassed partisans. Yeah. Um, they don't like what's happening. They don't like how how nasty everything is. And so they just call themselves independents, <laughs> even though they still reliably vote with their with the with one party. So why has this uh, intensity come along? And I I a lot of people, I think, casually identify it, say, with the rise of the Trump presidency. I view the Trump presidency as a symptom more than a, than a cause. It's just an example. It's just a dramatic example for how both sides can hate each other more intensely than they did before. And, of course, I think I'm older than you. I'm pretty confident about that. Uh, this goes back for me in my lifetime you know, to every – you know, I'm, my, I'm born in 1954, so – I remember the 1960 election. I was in grade school. I was six years old. I remember we drew pictures of elephants and mm. <laughs> donkeys. That was that was politics in 1960 in uh, in uh, Washington, uh, rural Washington's uh, state. But you know, shortly after that, uh, I'd say 72. I'm 18 years old. I remember how vicious politics was uh, in. When Nixon was president, when Reagan was president, when Clinton was president, when Obama was president, now when Trump is president, both sides angry, disdainful, dismissive, and and more than just my side's right and your side's wrong, it's my side's right and you're dangerous. It does feel like it's got that has gotten stronger in the last five to ten years, uh, but it's not new. So what is new about it in your view and what do you think explains the – if there is something new about it? Yeah, so so this is a great point. I, you know, I actually started this project in 2009. So uh, it's, it's definitely not about Trump. I had no – I had absolutely no inclination that Trump was coming. Nope. Um, Shame and, on you. you. Call yourself <laughs> no, a political I scientist. I yeah. should have known. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So the yeah so the, this this clearly is a phenomenon that predates Trump and um and and I think that you you what you're pointing to is a really interesting sort of historical view of you know what's been happening and and I I want to you know sort of predicate all of this on the idea that there should be party conflict right like we don't want right. the parties to be exactly the same and and we don't and obviously partisans are going to want their team to win no matter what um, and so it would be weird if we didn't have, you know, parties rooting for their own side and, and hating the other side to some degree, um, especially because elections are really just gigantic kind of games, right? Like it, it, it's like the Super Bowl. It, right. I, exactly. used to, I, had a, I used to have a good friend in St. Louis when I lived there who we got together for Super Bowl parties and election night parties and celebrated yes. to the extent it was possible that, you know, sometimes our team wasn't. In the Super Bowl, and our team wasn't really in the election because, for me, I'm never happy generally with either side. But that's you know that's but it's still fun. You still root yeah. and get excited. You might prefer one to the other. It's, it's, right. it's exciting. And we watch it on TV, and we yep. you know you know we know that the, the election <laughs> the the election results have come in. Little music theme that each channel has. Dun, dun. Um, yeah, it's it's fun. It's very exciting. So so it's hard not to root you know for one side. Um, the 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 thing that has changed, and this is really what the entire book is about, is um, that what we've we've always had a lot of conflict in, in American politics, and we've always had a lot of conflict in American society. Um, and just thinking about the 1960s, there's you know clearly there was a lot of of social unrest um, that I think exceeds what we're looking at right yeah, now. Absolutely. Um, the difference is that from the 1960s. Through, I would say, the 1990s, um, we essentially went through a period where our party identities became more closely associated with other social identities um, to the extent that in the 1960s, the social unrest wasn't entirely you couldn't you couldn't say that the two sides that were fighting were all Democrats versus Republicans. There was a mixture of partisans on both sides. And so what we what we're seeing now is that. 
the sides that are fighting are associated almost completely with either Democrats or Republicans. So the way that I explain it is, is essentially to say the Civil Rights Act, um, Civil Rights Movement, as, as that became a Democratic Party platform uh, issue, the Southern conservative Democrats were very unhappy about that. And, but partisanship is very strong, so it takes a really long time to change your party. It's like converting to another religion. Yeah. And, and so over a generation, they gradually became Republican, uh, Republicans. And that process in, in, you know, th- from the 1960s until I was, until the late nineties, there were still some people on both sides who were sympathetic to the, the desires of the other team. And that, I think that process really sort of culminated in, in maybe the, the Clinton years, um, or possibly even later. Um, but, but during that period, there were still some, some people who could say, oh, I understand what the other side is thinking. They're not, you know, they're not completely evil. Um, of course, there are some people who, who did think they were, the other side was evil. But, but there was some mixture within, within, the, within each party. And that is what I think has been disappearing. Yes, you know, now that I think about it, you know, the famous example from uh, the 70s and 80s was, you know, Scoop Jackson was a conservative Democrat. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller was a conser- was a liberal Republican. Mm-hmm. Now, now that I think about it, you know, there are two um, semi-liberal Republicans in the Senate, uh, Collins from Maine and um, mm-hmm. who am I thinking of from uh, uh, Murkowski from Alaska. I can't think of a conservative Democrat. There might be one. It just doesn't come to mind. But the point you're making, which is obviously true, is that so many votes now are party line votes. And you could say, well, that's just because – in the Senate, you could say, "Well, that's just because they make sure that they get everybody roped in, and they make compromises." And of course, that's part of it. But a lot of it is, which what your book's about, is that nobody wants to be seen voting with the bad mm-hmm. guys, and that just seems to me to be an unhealthy thing. And I, and I, at least it strikes me as an unhealthy thing. And, and your point about the '60s that I always late, lately make the point that. This is getting close to the 60s, which is a very tumultuous time. The difference is that we're in the middle of a war where you know, thousands of people are dying every year, thousands of Americans that caused a lot of unrest. We had a draft, so people didn't want to be drafted into it. And then here we are. So we are still somewhat at war, but no, most Americans aren't at risk of going into that war. Unemployment's 3.9% in the latest report. What would this be like if – Things weren't going well. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. just it's it's very. It, we'll talk later about whether this is just unpleasant or actually frightening. I'm heading toward toward uh, toward frightening. But the point that that you make in the book, and I, I want to let's hone in on this because you just mentioned it, but I want to now focus on it. Is is the social aspect of our tribalism and our identity? So it's not just that uh, my side. In politics is right. It's my sides. Also, all my other identities, all my other tribes are also in the same party as I am. Let's talk about that and how that – because I think that's really the, the deepest insight of the book and how – because that's plausibly something that has changed that, that would explain some of the, the uh, vehemence with which people look at each other. Yeah. So – and and if you look at um, – we have you know the American – Right. The American National Election Studies is a survey, elect, uh, election based survey, um, election year survey that's done, um, has been done every sing, every election year since 1948. Um, and so you can look at trends over time in this and actually find that this this is happening. This has been happening. Um, the parties are much more, much more divided on on race and on religiosity um, and uh, and on calling themselves liberals and conservatives, which is a different um issue, but we can talk about that later. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the results of this is this, and this is what I call social sorting is that we, you know, we're sort of moving into the parties that are more socially like us. So the Republican party is increasingly the party of, of white Christian, um, increasingly rural, uh, more men and the democratic party is sort of everyone else. 
and um, and so and we're getting very clear cues on which side we were supposed to be in, and so we're we're really moving completely into these two camps. Uh, and th- what that does is, and there's this there's uh, social social psychological research that that demonstrates that when you have two identities that are well aligned, and by well aligned that means that most of the of the people in Group A are also in Group B. So the example that I use is like Irish Catholic. Um, you know, people who are Irish Catholic, uh, they know a lot of Irish people and they know a lot of Catholic people and, uh, and, and maybe not as many non-Irish, non-Catholic people. And the more aligned your two identities are actually the more intolerant people have been found to be of outsiders. And when you have two identities that are not well aligned, so if you're like Irish and Jewish, then you're going to know a whole bunch of non-Irish people and a whole bunch of non-Jewish people. And, and so you tend to be more tolerant of outsiders because you sort of have this practice every day of going through your life knowing that these two parts of your identity um, are not well matched in society. And that finding alone um, can, can explain a lot of this in the, the effect of this sorting, social sorting on our partisanship because our, because our parties are, are now – much more socially distinct. Um, we don't have what we used to call cross-cutting identities, where you know, um, you know, your next-door neighbor is is maybe in a different party, but you guys go to church together, and so you have this cross-cutting identity that allows you to uh, think of each other as as normal human beings with good intentions. Or, or you um, go hunting together, which should be right. unimaginable for a large uh, swath of Americans right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and increasingly, the parties are not. You know, Republicans are are are. Christian, um, and, and Democrats are sort of everything, but, but increasingly Democrats are the party of secularism. Yes. That's the main religious divide is yep. religious or non-religious. Yep. Um, so, so the, the, the outcome of all of these sorted identities is essentially to make the other side seem, um, more unlike you and d- more difficult to, uh, humanize. Because you don't come in contact with them, you don't think about them as part of your group. You don't think about needing to respect them or 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 their you know they, them having families and good intentions. Um, that is you know that that's sort of the the dangerous outcome of this is that it's a lot easier to dehumanize the other side when you have these really well sorted uh, social identities. So that's plausible to me. I, I- and I don't know it's true, but it, it definitely seems plausible. It's related to a phenomenon that I was only become aware of in the last you know, couple of years, which is intersectionality. This idea that if you're with me on this issue, whatever it is, you've got to be with me on every issue uh, or you're not on the right team. And I don't know whether that's uh, a relatively new phenomenon, but it's consistent with what you're talking about that, you know, that that I – you and I say are consistent across the board and everything, and I think it, it certainly is plausible that that means we're going to have a tighter bond in in feeling this group identity. And the people who aren't someone who's different from me on not just one thing, a oh, different political party, but on different church or doesn't go to church or hunts or doesn't hunt or likes sports or doesn't or eats meat or doesn't. Um, is just uh, it, it's a weird moment to me in, in like human history where again we have this this tolerance uh, religion to some extent we're supposed to be tolerant of other people and yet it gets harder and harder because we've got all these boxes you have to check if you want to be on the right team. Yeah, right. The other thing, I mean, I, I would also I would also say that the other effect of this is that. Um, because so many identities are now aligned with the party, um, it used to be that, you know, when you watch election night coverage, which is lots of fun, um, if your party loses, then that's that your party's one part of your identity, but you still have all the other parts of your identity <laughs> that are not losers in that mm-hmm. moment. It's and like so when, it's, it's not- like when the you know, when the when the Red Sox would lose in the playoffs, I'd say, Here comes football season. You know, that would be a comfort to me. But yeah, if, if it's a, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Right. And it's the same it's the same sense that you're 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 going to be OK. Right. You as an individual are going to be OK because you have all these other things that define you and that are part of your identity. But if your racial identity and your religious identity and your cultural identity and your geographical identity are all wrapped up with your party, 
then if the party loses, it hurts a lot more psychologically. And if your party wins, then every part of you has won. And so that's part, one of the effects of this increased social sorting is that when elections occur, they're not just elections. They're not just competitions between the two parties. They become competitions between racial groups and religious groups. And that kind of thing is, is extremely dangerous. Yeah, it's um, – I'm not – it's hard to put my finger on it. It, it does feel like uh, – it just to me, it sort of ramps up the intensity of the feeling. I'm, I'm not sure – Right. I, in theory, if I lose this election, I still have my religious identity. I still have my cultural identity. But, but we're all in the same boat. All of us who've lost this, whatever it is, this election or whatever is the other. It could be other issues as well. Of course, it could be a Supreme Court decision on, on, on some social issue that that I share with with a bunch of people. But, um, and it just, you know, I, I think the, the human urge. You know, Adam Smith says it in the theory of moral sentiments. It's kind of a, it's it's. Um, I think it's deeply true. He says <laughs> we care, we want the people around us to like what we like, which is what we're talking about here to some extent. This this idea of of social sorting and a lack of cross cutting identity. He, but then he says what we really care about though is that our is that people our friends hate what we hate. <laughs> So, you know, if I see a movie I like, I hope you'll like it. But if, and if you don't, I'm going to be disappointed. I'm, why didn't you like it? But if, if there's a movie that I despised and you think it's wonderful, that's <laughs> really hard for us to process. And I think that is the reason this isn't perhaps uh, why it's so dangerous, you know, why it, it leads to this amplification. Right. And if you think about, you know, just in terms of evolutionary psychology, right, which one is more important for you to pay attention to, the thing that you really hate or the thing that you really love, right? If The thing that you really love is probably going to be there tomorrow and you can go after it again. The thing that you really hate is right in front of you and you better deal with it immediately because it's probably dangerous to you. So we're, we're naturally inclined as humans to have, you know, to pay attention to the things that we dislike um, because they're, they, you know, <laughs> Evolutionarily, they're more dangerous. They're more important. They're, they're immediate. Um, and so that idea of hating the people who are on the other side, um, not only does it, does it sort of make our polarization worse, but it also makes us pay more attention to politics uh, and then hate each other more and then pay more attention to politics. So it is sort of this, this um, vicious, vicious cycle. And, and I think the other part, you know, I talked about this in my my piece on this, the it's not always easy to admit, but we get pleasure from it. We get pleasure from disliking our opponents. We look, we get pleasure. You know, the standard way people I think think about it is we look down on them. It's, it makes you feel be- it makes you feel better to lower someone because you feel higher. But it's worse than that. I think. I think there's a certain visceral. It's. You know, I think it's clearly hardwired in us to. Exult in you know it's Schadenfreude writ large to exult in the misery of our enemies, and um, you know political discourse on both left and right Republicans and Democrats is uh, you know we have Trump talking about losers and we have Hillary talking about baskets of deplorables. It's just it's not a healthy situation. No, and in fact, there's uh, there's a study that that demonstrated that you can actually see in people's brain activity. Uh, you put people in like an fMRI machine uh, and show them a member of their in group um, you know winning something and they you know the or sorry the member of their in group uh, losing and they have these you know they're sort of sad upset uh, areas of their brain light up and then you show them a member of their out group losing and the and the pleasure parts of their brain light up yeah. so it's really Ooh. happening yeah yeah so what's to be done about this uh, or let me let me ask it let me let me let me just make one more point, which is the the role of the media, which is I, which I don't think you talked about in the book. What I argued in my piece is that the media has allowed us to customize our information flow and thereby reinforce this again to a, to a large degree. I don't have to watch uh, the news channels or the commentators who are even handed or who 
you know, might disagree with me. I'm just going to continually confirm my bias uh, by my Twitter feed and my Facebook feed and the social media I consume and the cable stations I watch. Do you think that plays a role? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it works in concert with a couple of things that we're already doing. So um, the first thing that I would say is the um, – one thing I haven't talked about yet that's that's an important part of the book is is these uh, this minimal group paradigm experiments, which essentially, is, you know, very briefly, people were told that they were a member of a group that they had never heard of before. There's no, you know, they're either overestimators or underestimators. Um, and then they're asked to allocate money to people that they've never met, they're never going to meet. Um, and they get the choice between, um, let's say, allocating you know five dollars to everybody in the whole experiment, or allocating four dollars to their own group, but three dollars to the out group members. And um, the experimenter, when he was when he was running this study, actually expected there to be no bias in this situation because the groups were so meaningless. Um, and in fact, what he found was that people were concerned about their group winning and and willing to sacrifice money in order to get the win condition. So they were not choosing the greater good condition where everyone gets the most. They were choosing the condition where everyone gets less, but the, but the out group gets even less. So there is a natural inclination for us to want our groups to win. And, uh, and so one of the things that the media does is tends, it tends to portray legislation even as Democrats or Republicans winning. And, and when you when every single thing the government does becomes a win for one side or the other, then government be, there should there will be no compromise, right? There's no reason for anyone to compromise um, because if they lose, then every then they, the whole party has this sense of loss. Even if they came, they, they did good legislation, right? And even if they came up with a great compromise and a really good policy that solved a problem. Um, that doesn't matter because it's being portrayed as a loss for one side. And so that side's never going to agree to that policy. And so we essentially are like gamifying the important work that government does. Um, and the media does this. This is, the, you know, not only do they cover everything as a horse race, but they also cover, you know, healthcare as a win for one side or the other, yep. which is damaging. Yeah, I know. You give the example of uh, government shutdown versus um, votes on uh, Obamacare. And, you know, I, I feel like that's what also is happening right now with immigration. Neither side wants to give the other side a win, so they can't compromise and solve the problem. And now we have this issue with tariffs. We are ratcheting up a trade war with China, and it's um, – You'd like to think, well, wiser heads will prevail. They'll they'll Mm -hmm. compromise on some issue of international intellectual property or some issue of investment flows or whatever it turns out to be. But I'm not convinced that's going to happen. It's hard for me to imagine, you know, a little bit more about American politics than Chinese politics. They're both a small amount in each case, but (laughs) it's hard to imagine that Trump would quote take a loss on this. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I doubt the Chinese will either. I don't think they're eager to tell their people, uh, yeah, the Americans pushed us around. So I I just – so many issues today seem beyond compromise and it's a winner take all where your your guys get get into power and then you get to do what you want. And and one of the deepest, most depressing things for me as a small government type person, uh, classical liberal, is that uh, the idea that – executive power keeps growing, I like to fantasize that that would encourage people to think that maybe we should limit executive power because the guy who's in right now isn't my guy. Right. And instead, people say, oh, well, it's OK, because when my guy gets in, it'll be better. <laughs> and it's, I'll get mine or we'll get ours or whatever it is. And, and we'll just, get everything. Yeah, we'll be in charge. And that just seems yeah. like it's interesting because that's a parliamentary system is a little more like that, not Totally, but a little more like that. And America's always been less like that, and we're heading to being more like that, where if you can control things, that's where you get stuff done, and nothing gets done when there's gridlock, when there's literally gridlock because the parties are have mixed control of the different institutions because they don't compromise. 
Right. And that's the important thing. This is the, the, you know, the agreement part of the uncivil agreement title is that this is true on issues where the vast majority of the American public agrees. So, right. We, it's just that you can't get legislation done because it seems like a win or a loss. So, so the example, one of the examples I give in the book is that um, after Sandy Hook, um, you know, 90 percent of Americans agreed that, that we should have background checks for gun purchases. And, and like 86 percent of Republicans agreed to that. And but then asked whether or not they wanted the Senate to pass a background checks bill. Uh, only 57 percent of Republicans agreed that this, that there should be legislation passed to enact the thing that 87 percent of them thought was good. And it, that means that there is a there is a disconnect between what the what the people actually want government to do and what they're willing to allow government to do in order to protect their sense of victory. And it, this is them sacrificing that dollar, you know, to 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 get the victory over, you know, something that the almost the entire country agrees would be beneficial. Yeah, we talk about the fact that, and I have this romance myself to some extent, though I think listeners would maybe think that's not the case. But you know, there is this view that political outcomes are the aggregation of preferences of citizens. And we spent a lot of time on this program talking about how. There's a lot of slippage in the, in that connection and also the fact that we don't have a will of the people. There's often a great deal of disagreement. But your point is, is that the correlation between, politi- between I- policy preferences of citizens and political outcomes is being reduced because of this partisan uh, intensity. Right. When you have a zero sum type of competition between the parties, there's no place in the middle for compromise to occur. And compromise is the only way that legislation gets done and democracy functions. There's no other way for democracy to work um, if there is no compromise. Yeah, I think I think this is a quote. You say Democrats and Republicans are in a battle over health care, over abortion, over tax policy. The political fights in American American politics are supposed to be about about something. An abundance of evidence, however, contradicts this view, which is crazy. Like, like, what's the what's the alternative? And 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 how does this reality start to change what what politicians how they behave and, and and how they campaign? Yeah, this is so this is a really dangerous part of it is because when once the once the need for victory surpasses the actual policy preferences of people or even, you know, your your party's position can actually change your policy position at this point. We've seen there's evidence that that if your party switches position, then then the majority of people will also switch their position on something. Well, the Trump and the um, trade example, just a perfect example that so yeah. many Republicans were, quote, free traders. I'm a, I'm a big free trader, so I'm, I kind of like the fact I, – I, again, it's naive to think this, but I like the imagining the possibility that because Trump is so uh, protectionist, this will cause many people who used to be protectionists to become free traders. Uh, mm-hmm. and so, but certainly many, many Republicans who were free traders have started to think, well, actually, you know, it turns out uh, – and it's effortless. It's effortless. It's not like there's this long process by which they come to a different view. It's overnight. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's not a lot of reflection about like what happened when we changed our position. You know, like what were the reasons that we it's it just it's as if reality shifts and no one talks about it. Um, So I interrupted you. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. It's. Um, the pro- so the problem with this, though, is that if your if your party can change your policy positions, then your party can do almost anything um, without being held accountable for it. Yep. So if you, you know, if we really did care, if we really held these trade policies genuinely, then Trump would be held accountable for, you know, shifting the trade policies of the Republican Party. Um, but that's not that's not happening. So there is essentially our elected officials can do um, re- really bad things and be and and still be just as popular as they were before they did bad things um, because we're so we're so focused on winning partisan victory that will allow our uh, you know our elected officials to to do almost anything. It's like that picture of those two guys that's going all around Twitter last couple of days saying I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat. No, right? Yeah, yeah. Was that? Yeah, that's what it was. Right? Yeah. This is, I mean, it's like literally what the anything. Heck? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, like yeah, you that can, is you perfect. For being another country. Yeah. 
That used uh, to be called uh, treasonous or like yeah. uh, un-American. Let's just leave it at that. Let's. I mean, well, it's a perfect description. It used to be considered un-American. Now it's not. It's bizarre. Well, and this is actually something, this is, you know, kind of tying this back to the very beginning of the Republic when, you know, wa- George Washington in his farewell address uh, warned about this. He said, he specifically warned about um, really intense partisanship. Um, he said, if, if, I can't remember the exact quote, but basically what he said was, you know, if partisanship becomes too intense, then outside, the foreign influences can start to, to take advantage of our divides and influence our government via party passions. So mm, Washington himself it's something. <laughs> figured this out and he was worried about it going, you know, and, it, and of course, partisanship immediately started the very next, <laughs> the very yeah. next election. Yeah. Uh, but, but it, you know, it's, it's not, it's not an unfamiliar idea that, that, that extreme partisanship is dangerous. And, uh, but we, we seem to just not care about it because we're all so focused on our partisanship. Yeah. Well, the, you know, they point about the media allowing in the current landscape with the Internet and social media to allow us to tailor our own information flows to confirm our biases and make us feel good about ourselves and not so good about others. That's a world where I'm talking about the honest uh, media, meaning just the natural choices that people can make now are different and for what they watch aren't just three TV uh, networks to watch the news, which were all pretty much the same. Uh, but, of course – that doesn't take account of the potential for manipulation, either by uh, partisan activists or foreigners, to influence our election. And uh, I'm deeply worried about this. I I, I don't have an easy solution. Uh, are you worried about that? That and by that by that I mean uh, the ability to inflame partisan uh, intensity with. With literally with with fake news or lies, just showing stuff that didn't happen, uh, because people understand through their uh, their uh, the data that they have on people's search habits and other things to manipulate them in ways that are that people don't realize. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's you know one thing one of the things to remember about the the Russian ad buys is that they were buying. Um, ads not just on behalf of Donald Trump, like pro-Trump ads, but they were also buying pro-Bernie ads um, and um, pro-Black Lives Matter ads in order to further inflame the Democratic Party, so to divide the Democratic Party from itself um, and and make both Democrats and Republicans focus on these sort of racial differences that were there between the parties um, that that are these very deep divides that we've always been, you know, that we, we've always had in American politics. Um, but making sure that we, we remembered that that was what we were voting about. And and yeah, it is. It's it's particularly because we can we can we will listen to almost anything our party says. Yeah, we're very vulnerable um, to in, to any kind of influence, including our party's influence. Um, and also, this is the this is the other sort of um, s- sort of distressing thing is that one thing that we know about the way that people process information is that not only do we look for information that we agree with and we try to avoid information that we disagree with. But also, if we see information that we don't like, uh, we tend to counter argue it in our heads. Yep. And, the, and the more political information we have, the better we are at it. So the people who are, who are paying the most attention to politics are actually the ones that are best able to counter argue any argument that they don't want to hear. So and it's not necessarily that they have good information. They just have a lot of information. Um, That's and, fascinating. Yeah. So it's not like educating, you know, people or giving them tons of, uh, of corrective information is going to solve anything because the people who have who know the most and are, therefore are the most active usually um, are are also the most biased in their processing of information. Yeah, I love that. So they're uh, this is true in economics, too, of course, uh, and and in social science generally the so-called experts people like you and you and i who have phds what we're really good at is telling a story and find cherry picking the data one of the things we're good at is cherry picking data to show that we're still right uh mm-hmm. we can find that study because we know about a lot of studies so we can find the studies that confirm our our ideological or or methodological biases and it's just it flips on on its head the idea that 
you know, people who are uninformed, you kind of hope they don't vote much. Uh, but maybe they're the ones that uh, are less vulnerable to this. But I think we're all vulnerable to it, obviously. It, it's easy, so easy to dismiss uh, the other side's arguments. If we can't think of the arguments or the studies, we'll just dismiss them because they're just wrong anyway. We know that. Well, this is actually – it's sort of a contra- controversial argument, but in one of the earliest books about political behavior, it's just called Voting, um, the, 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 the authors actually said we actually need the disinterested and cross-pressured voters. Um, they may not have a lot of information, but – they will respond to large, large things. And so if something gigantic happens and the government needs to be held accountable for it, those are the people who are going to create accountability. We actually need the people who don't know much to be in the electorate yeah. because they're the only place where we have any room to hold elected officials accountable. So one of the ways you think we could do something about this uh, is to cr- have a, par- a third party. It was based on civility, based on tolerance, more centrist. Uh, and, of course, people are out there saying, yeah, well, that's my party. Yeah, I already have – that already exists. <laughs> uh, and, and I can't – it's amazing to me how often um, people will write me and say, and I'm sure you get this too, that, well, this is only true of one party or one type of uh, views. But, of course, it's both sides. Um, we're both vulnerable – both sides are vulnerable to these, these psychological phenomena. So you think, well, let's have a party that's that's not – we need a third party. And, of course, as you say, the Democratic Party was greatly uh, challenged by the 2016 election, as was the Republican Party. Either party could split very, very dramatically the populist wing of the Republican Party, which was basically silent until very recently. is now seems to be totally in charge, uh, The national, what I'd call the nationalist populist um, – protection aside. So there's room among Republicans in theory for a uh, more economically uh, free market part, party or socially liberal party to come along and, and peel off some Republicans who are uncomfortable with with the direction that Trump has taken the party. And similarly, a lot of Democrats want to go much farther to the left than, say, Hillary Clinton, uh, who was you know the last candidate in their next election. And that may not be sustainable. That may lead to uh, – I think that's what's going to happen, and that would, could easily lead to the re-election of Trump, which is going to cause a lot of hair to be pulled out. So so it's, you'd think this is a time when a third or fourth party with some serious potential to, to have an impact could start. And yet, um, very hard in a two-party system to get a third party that's effective. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's – so um, Lee Drutman at New America Foundation has been writing a lot of really interesting um, stuff on how – what we actually need to do is change to a parliamentary system. Yeah. Um, because until we have proportional representation, we will never have a third party. This is Duverger's law is that if you have a first-past-the-post, uh, majority wins uh, electoral system, then you will always have two parties. Uh Right. It's because if, if we had a if we had a proportional representation system, then if there's a party that won 15 percent of the vote, they could get 15 percent of the seats. That would be great. Right. Then then you could actually have a, a you'd viable have to compromise. Third party. You'd have to get stuff done. You'd have to take them into account. Right. And there would be there would be uh, coalitions and uh, and therefore different, you know, the different parties would be sometimes working together and sometimes not. So that reduces the zero sum aspect of what we currently have. Of course, Um, if you go to a system that's parliamentary, like my favorites, Israel, they all will tell you the real the only problem with the Israeli political system is it's parliamentary. (laughs) (laughs) So grass is always greener. (laughs) Grass is always greener. Um, but the, I think I'm more in terms of you know I don't think American America is going to move to a proportional representation system and that takes that's probably a little a step too far who knows though um, but a more realistic um, possibility would be something like what happened to the Southern Democrats um, yep. in in the 1960s which is that a, sort of a wing of one of the parties or a, a, a substantial group of one of the parties starts voting with the other side. Um, in, in a somewhat reliable way. And that really changes the dynamic of the, the you know, win-lose, you know, yeah. zero-sum uh, part of it. So that, you know, gradually 
these, you know, sort of like libertarian Republicans would, you know, vote with Democrats, centrist Democrats, you know, more and more. And maybe gradually, if, you know, the Trump wing of the and sort of populist um, and also somewhat, you know, like also like white supremacist wing of the Republican Party is uh, is still there, um, that will turn away a lot of the more yeah. more libertarian Republicans. And they and they might start voting with Democrats if it means they have they're, they're voting against white supremacy. Right. So, so yeah, the only is, pro- yeah, the only problem with that is that if Bernie or. Or Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, or someone K- Kamala Harris is the nominee. It's going to be really hard, I think, for those Republicans to hold their nose and, you know, it it and vote for them because it's like you know it's and part of it, of course, is like, you know, I, I just can't put on a Yankees hat. I'm sorry, it just it's just <laughs> not happening. But but it's it's really sunny out. It's all I've got. I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll, it's okay. I'll, I'll I'll get sunstroke. Let's do the sunburn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's. Uh, I think a really good example of this is the Alabama Senate race, oh, yeah. um, where it, it wasn't that a whole bunch of white uh, Republicans voted for the Democrat, although some did, but some not a did. lot. Yeah, some did. Uh, but mostly the, the most the most pro Roy Moore districts in Alabama just had much lower turnout yep. than normal. And so that is one way that this could go is that, you know, if if there is such an extremism within the you know, ascendant within the Republican Party, that might just turn off enough people that they're just going to stop voting and that, you know, if they don't vote, that swings the election. So yeah. so that is what, you know, it, it, there should be some accountability, maybe not in switching to the voting for the other party, but in um, just not not turning out. That would be sort of the the only way I can imagine accountability working. All right. Well, that's right the same now. thing can happen on the Democratic side. If they if they end yeah. up pushing way to the left, no one's not, very few Democrats are going to vote for Trump, but they just won't vote. They just will that's stay possible. home. Yeah. Well, we don't have a lot of time left, but which is good because uh, we're going to turn now to how to what we can do about this. And since <laughs> it's a short list for me, I have a few thoughts, but uh, most of my listeners have heard mine. I have one to add. Um, I, what are your thoughts? What can we do as human beings? Not necessarily as we're not giving consulting advice now to operatives within either party, which is an interesting moral question of what you should do in that situation. <laughs> uh, you know how, how to ma- manipulate people, but uh, just as citizens or as policy positions that might policy things that might change to make this better. What, what, what are you What are you thinking? So uh, one thing is actually for the media to stop doing the horse race thing with legislation. Yeah. I think that would be helpful. Um, then they'll get fewer listeners and viewers. Exactly. And then, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> it's boring. It's boring yeah. if you talk about the minutia of a bill. Um, so so that, that's unlikely. Um, the, the, the thing that we can do as individual people is, um, first of all, acknowledge that we are inclined to think this way. Yep. Um, by, by understanding it, it's easier to counter argue it in your own head, um, and to try not to do it so much. Um, the other, the other thing is to honestly, because politics is so fraught at this point, my recommendation is always just like, don't talk about, go hang out with people who are not like you, but don't talk about politics with them. Um, do something else like, you know, everybody go do, do some service together or, you know, join a join a club with people who are in your outgroup party, and don't talk about politics. But find ways to to connect with people that are as unlike humans, you as human beings. Yeah, and so then and then you can start thinking of them as people who have families, and and then you know when they come up with their when you know when they're thinking about politics, they have they have thoughts in their head, and they're trying to work things through, and they're trying to be good people sometimes. Um, and and so, you know, it's this idea of, you know, trying to reach out. The problem with this, though, <laughs> is that the people who are the most likely to do that are also the people who are the least needing of it. Right. So yeah. you have to be motivated to want to create less of a divide to do that. And the most divisive people don't want a less don't want less of a divide. So it's, it doesn't work exactly. It doesn't work all that well because the people who need it are not doing it. Um, 
And in fact, I think, you know, maybe we should just enforce it somehow on a national level, like have some kind of, you know, national service. Um, this is, you know, in the military, this, you know, partisanship sort of disappears. Yep. Um, so, you know, if there was some way to get Americans working together at some point to, you know, I'm not sure how, but, mm. that, you know, working on some type of national service could bring people together in ways that are unlikely in their current in their current lives. Um, and yeah, other than that, it's very it's. It's just very hard to to get people who don't want to do this don't want to, don't want to heal a divide um, to heal it. You can't really force them to. Yeah, I, I do think you know what we're doing right now to make people aware of it. I think is a good thing. I think most people don't like the idea of being disdainful of others and and switching their views to satisfy their party. Identity. I think most people, when confronted with that in the light of day, think, hey, I wouldn't do that. And if they're doing it, would go, yeah, maybe I shouldn't. Uh, so I think that, that helps something. I, I think we're doing something here. Though we think about the media, and I, you know, I wasn't joking, obviously, very much in the media's interest in a world that's extremely competitive and where there's been an immense amount of disruption to desperately seek eyeballs and clicks. So I understand why they do what they do, but there are – Organizations like ProPublica that have been started by foundations that are not as driven by clicks and and views, which I think has has some potential. In my essay I, and in my podcast on this episode, I, I suggested that people follow people on Twitter and, and Facebook who aren't like them. Uh, and yet one of the problems there is that that actually can make it worse <laughs> because a yeah. lot of the people who aren't like me, I, who I follow on Twitter, do increase my outrage because they they're so unfair or they're so wrong or whatever it is so when when i give that advice i now add and try to find the quieter more thoughtful ones there are some yeah. on the other side no matter what side you are on but the other advice that i that your book made me think of and i had just been actually writing about it a little was the idea of find some different groups to hang out in you know get outside your partisan group and you know, I, my joke was: if you're a Democrat, go to a NASCAR race, and if you're a Republican, you know, do some yoga. And of course, <laughs> there are people who on there are Democrats who go to NASCAR races. There are Republicans who do yoga already. Uh, the problem there again is that if you pick the wrong group to to try to humanize the other side, it could just make you matter uh, to see that they're you know that just confirms your prejudices if you're not careful. So you need to find an activity that isn't likely to make it worse. Um, uh, so well, and also that you you know what we're we don't want to recommend that, for instance, you know, a, a, an African American Democrat go by themselves to a NASCAR race. They're probably going to feel possibly threatened there. You know, so I that's don't know. The other I, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think that's a prejudice. I don't know if that's true. It's hard for me to say. I've never, <laughs> never been to a NASCAR race. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that's a fascinating question, right? Of, of of how far you should go out of your comfort zone, right? If you're if you're not a churchgoer to go to church, if you're not a a hunter is, to yeah, go better, hunting, yeah. I think that would be extremely difficult. Um, it, it's true. I think you'd find out that they're nice, normal people. Um, many of them, maybe some of them aren't, of course. But I think that is a way. I think exposure in general is good. So I'm I'm all for that. I think the question is, there may be some challenges people have with with their biases and in, in processing those experiences that that might be challenging that's all yeah so let's close with a really uh, cheerful question do you think we're um at risk of civil war i i started to wonder if that's a possibility uh if we did get say 10 percent unemployment in this in this world that we're in now or worse a, a you know a terrorist event of some kind equivalent to 9-11 which you know i think the aftermath of 9-11, most people would say, was was pretty good for America. We did come together for at least a couple of days, maybe even a few <laughs> weeks. Uh, but this time, maybe that wouldn't be the response. Um, maybe it'd be something worse and different. Uh, so w what are your thoughts on that? Do you think we're at a uniquely dangerous time here, or is this just sort of where we are and we're, we're over-exaggerating yeah, I go back and forth on this, um, partly because I don't I don't want there to be a civil war. So I'm trying Me to find either. ways to <laughs> suggest that there won't be one. Um, the 
there is work on like in comparative politics, looking at other countries um, that, you know, where where scholars are, you know, they they make models predicting, you know, the probability that a nation will descend into civil war. And there are certain things that are really good predictors of that. Um, racial and ethnic uh, political divisions is one of them um, or religious political divisions. We have both of those um, uh, an adverse regime change, which I think, you know, some people would say is what Trump was, well, Democrats would say is that what Trump was for them, um, and economic, economic struggles. So, so the last one is the one that we don't have yet. Um, and, uh, and I don't want to say like all of, you know, if we, if we have a recession, then we're going to, you know, descend into civil war, because I, I think a lot of that is also in, in countries where democratic institutions are not as strong as ours presumably are. Um, the, the, the one of my concerns in 2016 actually was that was that if Clinton did win, that we would have a um, a legitimacy uh, problem where because Trump was already starting this like, you know, the election is rigged type of language. And so my my one concern is that if we have a close election, um are the um, the amount of faith that voters have in the in the electoral system right now is probably not that great, and um, and so any question about the validity of an, an of an electoral outcome that could be the type of thing I think that 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 causes a type a real a really dangerous clash between Democrats and Republicans because it puts partisanship right up front. It's, it seems like an unfair thing that happened, and people are going to get very, very angry um, if that type of thing happens. So well, for I me, think, that's my biggest concern. I think we're already there to some extent. I, I hear constantly in my Twitter feed from pe- people on the left that Trump is illegitimate because he only won the Electoral College. Uh, that is the way we elect a mm-hmm. president. Uh, you might not like it, but that is the way you're elected in America, and of course – it's the way people campaign. At least they're mm-hmm. supposed to if they're smart. Um, so I, I feel like it's just so easy to spread rumors of voter, you know, dishonesty, you know, corrupt voting, which is a, is a real problem <laughs> on uh, both sides of the political divide, um, the partisan divide. And so, I, and we're not going to have. I don't think we're going to have a non-close election. For yeah, a while, no, very it unlikely. seems that way. That that eh, it's hard to say, but I, I think that is a, that is a good point. I think the feeling that the an unfair result happened, which is what I think people would use to justify you know violence, is um, it's really scary. Yeah, and we're not we're not there yet in the, in the sense of there isn't violence, right? We're we're not in a violent place yet. Um, the question is, you know, if. <laughs> The, the difference between the left and the right is that the left is generally not armed yes, as exactly. well. <laughs> yep. Uh, oh, that'll so, change. Don't worry. <laughs> but you're well, right. <laughs> it might. Uh, it, but so the, the, you know, so the left goes, does marches and, um, and that's why I was concerned about the uh, the Clinton victory was that I was concerned about sort of you know there there are no, hundreds of of identified you know armed militia groups in the U.S. Um, and they tend not to be Democrats or yeah, liberals. That's true, but that'll I, I, I'm seeing you know, that will change the the um, and historically there's been there's violence on both sides, so it's it's not. Um, Right. If but, violence begins, then yeah. yeah. But you're right. Right now, it's uh, at least that's our. That seems to be the case that Republicans are more likely to own guns than, than Democrats. Yeah. That, that's definitely true. Um, let's close on a ch- slightly cheerier note. Do you have anything positive? Anything encouraging um, that makes you feel somewhat comfortable, comforted, but going forward? Uh, I don't usually have a lot of comforting uh, research, but I did just uh, <laughs> I did just finish a project um, looking at providing providing information to voters about candidates' character and whether or not that can um, a whether you can correct misinformation that they might hold and b whether um, that changes their approval of the of the candidate. And we found a little bit of evidence that if you explain, you know, if, if there the assumption in the, the, the story was Trump, you know, Trump is uh, was a, a sort of a self-made billionaire. Um, 
and and all, the, all we did was say, you know, were you aware that, you know, Fred Trump, Donald Trump's father, you know, was a successful businessman and loaned him millions of dollars. Um, and just a, just asking them the question introduced that information into respondents' minds. And then after reading that, they um, they rated tr- Donald Trump as less empathetic and less good at business. And their ap- approval ratings of him declined. Not a lot, but a little, like 12 points or something. That's a lot. Um, that's a, yeah, that can be a lot if you're in the middle. So, so that to me was like, oh, we actually you can you can provide information in some contexts <laughs> that that can that can change people's opinions and um, and correct correct misinformation that they may be holding. So that's one tiny little bit of optimistic evidence. My guest today has been Liliana Mason. Her book is Uncivil Agreement. Liliana, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks so much for inviting me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.